Hello viewers, I'm your host Pratiksha Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India's growing influence on the global stage was highlighted recently through significant diplomatic engagements with two key partners, Saudi Arabia and Russia. As India continues to expand its footprint in global diplomacy, these strategic relationships hold immense potential in shaping regional and international affairs. Let's now take a closer look at both meetings, starting with Saudi Arabia. India's relationship with Saudi Arabia has evolved into a dynamic and multifaceted partnership underpinned by deep-rooted historical ties, strong economic cooperation and shared strategic interests. Located at the crossroads of Asia and the Middle East, India and Saudi Arabia have long enjoyed a strong, mutually beneficial relationship. On November 13, Saudi Arabia's Foreign Minister Faisal bin Farhan bin Abdullah held high-level talks with India's External Affairs Minister Subramaniam Jaishankar in New Delhi. The bilateral discussions covered a range of critical issues including the ongoing Israel-Palestinian conflict with both leaders emphasizing the need for coordinated efforts to promote regional and international peace and security. We recognize the importance of sustained coordinated efforts across all areas of cooperation. On regional and international affairs, we believe our coordination is essential. We will continue to align our positions on issues of shared concern, especially as they pertain to international peace, security and economic development. We are confident that advancing cooperation serves our mutual interests as well as benefits the region more broadly. Saudi Arabia, as an important trade partner, has become an integral part of India's economic landscape. The two nations share a dynamic and growing trade relationship with bilateral trade valued at $52.76 billion in 2023. In addition to strengthening ties with Saudi Arabia, India is also deepening its cooperation with Russia. During an Intergovernmental Commission meeting in New Delhi on November 12, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Denis Mantrov emphasized Moscow's strong commitment to signing a free trade agreement between India and the Eurasian Economic Union. This move is expected to further boost trade and economic relations between India and Russia. Co-chairing the Commission, Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jaishankar praised the growth in bilateral trade with Russia, underscoring the expanding partnership. The growth in the bilateral trade, now estimated at US dollar 66 billion, has been impressive. Our goal is that it needs to be more balanced and that will require addressing current constraints and undertaking greater facilitative efforts. Making it easier to do trade should be accompanied by progress in the negotiations on the India-Eurasian Economic Union FTA. During his visit, Mantrov also called on Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to discuss a broad range of issues including trade, energy, economic cooperation and enhanced connectivity between the two nations. Moreover, Mantrov also participated in the plenary session of the Russian Indian Business Forum in Mumbai. The forum brought together a diverse group of stakeholders, including government officials and representatives from key industries and businesses in both India and Russia. There are a lot of uh, traditional sectors between our countries, but now um, we see that uh, the diversification uh, of, of the uh, mutual trade is um, uh, going now. Uh, and the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Mantorov, um, emphasized it um, during the plenary session uh, here in Mumbai. And of course, uh, there are sectors uh, that uh, we could be useful uh, for each other. And um, there are a lot of good examples from, from, from the previous years. As India continues to strengthen its diplomatic ties with both Saudi Arabia and Russia, these partnerships are poised to play a key role in shaping the geopolitical and economic landscape of the coming years. With an eye on deepening trade, fostering stability and promoting mutual prosperity, 
India's strategic engagement with these nations underscores its growing influence on the world stage. The political crisis in Bangladesh has deepened with protest, a controversial arrest warrant for Sheikh Hasina and mounting divisions continuing to fracture the nation. While the interim government led by Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus has promised reforms, many remain sceptical about the likelihood of real change. The growing attacks on religious minorities only intensify the unrest. As trust in the government's ability to hold free and fair elections erodes, the future of Bangladesh becomes increasingly uncertain. Take a look. In a controversial move, the portrait of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the founder of Bangladesh, was removed from the President's office in Dhaka. This followed mounting criticism and pressure from student leaders who have been agitating against the ousted Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina. Since the violent protests that led to Hasina's removal in August, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Hasina's father, and the architect of Bangladesh's independence has become a target of the protesters' ire. Statues, portraits, busts and even banknotes bearing his likeness have been defaced or dismantled as a symbol of resistance to his legacy. For many, anything remotely connected to the father of the nation has come to be seen as a symbol of the old political order. The situation in Bangladesh has grown increasingly volatile, with a deepening sense of lawlessness and instability gripping the country. Opposition groups, particularly supporters of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, are vocal in their demands for accountability, focusing much of their anger on Sheikh Hasina's long-standing rule. Recently, thousands of BNP supporters marched through Dhaka calling for Hasina to be tried for alleged corruption and human rights abuses during her time in power. এই যে খুনি হাসিনা গত 16 থেকে 17 বছর ধরে বাংলাদেশের যে গণতান্ত্রিক ব্যবস্থাকে ধ্বংস করেছে তার বিপরীতে আমরা খুনি হাসিনার বিচার দাবি করছি এবং একই সাথে সাথে যে অন্তবর্তীকালীন সরকার এখন রাষ্ট্র ক্ষমতায় রয়েছে আমরা বিশ্বাস করি তারা দ্রুত সময়ের মধ্যে একটি জনগণের সরকার প্রতিষ্ঠা করবে লাস্ট মান্থ বাংলাদেশের ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ক্রাইমস ট্রাইব্যুনাল ইস্যুড অ্যান অ্যারেস্ট ওয়ারেন্ট ফর ফর্মার প্রাইম মিনিস্টার শেখ হাসিনা accusing her of complicity in mass killings during violent protests earlier this year. The violent unrest forced Hasina to flee to India on August 5th, while an interim government led by Nobel Peace Prize laureate Muhammad Yunus took control of the country. However, rather than signaling a path towards peace, the situation has only exacerbated the political and social divisions within Bangladesh. The unrest has deepened the rift between pro-Hasina forces and opposition groups. What many had hoped would be a peaceful transition has instead fueled a cycle of tension and instability that shows no sign of resolution. আমি আসলাম আজকে কারণই যে বর্তমান যিনি সাবেক যে সরকার ছিলেন তিনি ছাত্রদের মানুষের উপরে ব্যবসার উপরে অনেক নির্যাতন অবস্থা ছিলেন তার বিচার এই দেশ আইন না সুন্দরভাবে যাতে নিরপেক্ষ বিচার হয় তার বিচার করতে হবে এমন কি এই দেশের অবাক সুষ্ঠু নিরপেক্ষ নির্বাচন সামনে যেন অনুষ্ঠিত হয় সেই জন্য আমাদের আজকে কর্মসূচি দেওয়ার উদ্দেশ্য Despite the interim government's promises of reform, many Bangladeshis are skeptical that change is possible. Increasing attacks on religious minorities, especially Hindus, have become collateral damage in the struggle for power. Public opinion is divided and trust in the government's ability to bring about free and fair elections is at all-time low. With each passing day, the hope for a unified and peaceful Bangladesh dims. As the nation grapples with its future, the question remains, will Bangladesh find a way out of this deepening crisis or is it on the path to a fractured, violent future? The answer is unclear, 
For many, the situation is becoming increasingly hopeless. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. US, Japanese and South Korean naval forces conducted their most sophisticated and final joint drills in East Asian waters ahead of President Joe Biden transferring one of his key national security initiatives to Donald Trump. During a visit to the USS George Washington aircraft carrier, US Ambassador to Japan Raham Emanuel stated that the trilateral agreement and the resulting military collaboration sent a powerful signal to Beijing. If you look at the region and you want to project deterrence, you want to ensure the security of America's interests, it's better to have allies because remember in this area and region we have a lot of allies and China does not. Mauritian politician Naveen Ramgulam was sworn in as Prime Minister for his fourth term a decade after he last left power following his coalition's dramatic triumph in a general election. His alliance Do Changement coalition won a landslide 60 of the 62 National Assembly seats with 62.6% of votes in ballet. Ramgulam took the oath of office during a brief ceremony at State House, the official residence of President Prithviraj Singh Rupan, in front of a selection of lawmakers, foreign diplomats and top civil servants. Iranian Foreign Minister Abbas Arakchi told International Atomic Energy Agency Chief Rafal Grossi that Iran will never negotiate under pressure and intimidation during a meeting in Tehran on November 14. In a post on his ex-account, Arakchi said that Iran will continue their full cooperation with the IAEA. Grossi has for months sought progress with Iran on issues including a push for more monitoring cooperation at nuclear sites and explanation of uranium traces found at undeclared sites. In a stunning turn of events, Sri Lankan's National People's Power Party led by President Anura Kumaradasanaike has secured a decisive victory in the country's snap parliamentary elections. The NPP, which previously held just three seats, called for fresh elections after the Sanaike's rise to the presidency in September. With a strong anti-corruption message, the party promised to address long-standing issues. A report. The National People's Power Party, a socialist political alliance led by Sri Lankan President Anura Kumaradasanaike, has secured a landslide victory in the parliamentary snap election. The Sanaike's strategic decision to call for immediate elections proved highly effective, paving the way for the party's remarkable rise. Prior to the elections, the NPP held only three seats in parliament, prompting the president to dissolve the assembly and seek a fresh mandate. Elected as president in September, the Sanaike, a self-identified Marxist, campaigned on promises to tackle corruption and reclaim misappropriated assets. After casting his vote in Colombo, the Sanaike expressed confidence that the people would support his vision for change. <laughs> मैं मेतिवार ने दी जाति के जनवाले विकामत साक्तिमत पार्लिमेंट वर्ष संधा जनवर में अपेक्षा करनो ये जनवर में जनता विसिंग अपने लबादे ने बवा पे विश्वास है तभी नो। श्रीलंकन्स वेंट टू द पोल्स इन अ क्रूशल जनरल इलेक्शन जस्ट टू मंथ्स आफ्टर इलेक्टिंग पॉलिटिकल आउटसाइडर अनुरा कुमार दिस the election became necessary because the National People's Power held only three seats in the outgoing parliament, which was set to complete its five-year term in August 2025. In order to push forward his policy agenda, the Sanaike sought a fresh mandate from the people. With 17.1 million eligible voters, including around 1 million first-time voters, the election marked a significant moment in Sri Lanka's political landscape. We need to select the people who can serve the country without any corruptions. 
so that's why we came here to vote ask the vote to select the correct candidate rate purwesek wenapi aniwaryama chande deela hari minissu parliament ata yawana eka ape yudukama e yudukama ishta karanna thama mama ada chande paachi kare with the commanding majority in parliament the national people's power party is now in a strong position to implement its ambitious reform agenda however while the party's victory signals a fresh political mandate it also brings with it significant challenges that will test the leadership of president anura kumara disanayake and his administration the sri lankan economy is still reeling from the devastating 2022 financial crisis is one of the most pressing issues facing the new government although there has been some progress in stabilizing the economy the country continues to grapple with a massive national debt a crippling cost of living crisis and inflation that has deeply affected ordinary citizens addressing these economic challenges will require careful and at times unpopular policy decisions to balance fiscal responsibility with the need to stimulate growth and create jobs Pakistan's control over Balochistan is eroding as calls for autonomy grow louder driven by decades of exploitation neglect and systemic repression the province rich in resources remains one of the country's most impoverished with the baloch people subjected to military crackdowns enforced disappearances and widespread human rights abuses The recent deadly bombing in Quetta claimed by the Balochistan Liberation Army underscores the deepening crisis a report The attack on Quetta's railway station on November 9th which claimed at least 26 lives and injured over 60 is just the latest in a series of violent incidents reflecting the worsening insurgency in Balochistan The Balochistan Liberation Army which has waged a campaign for independence for decades swiftly claimed responsibility. The group stated that this suicide bombing was a direct strike against Pakistan's military presence which many Baloch regard as an occupying force rather than a source of security. The Pakistan army itself says 14 soldiers were killed and numerous were injured. The soldiers a Pakistani soldier is the super race in that country they don't mingle with civilians they don't travel in the same buggies and train stations where civilians go so primarily the army was targeted and they were the uh, main hadaf of the vla i believe and they are the ones uh, who uh, were targeted so there was no civilians i believe it's just a uh, make believe to break propaganda against such organizations that they terrorists and they kill civilians because i think uh, pakistan army I mean the loss of innocent life everybody condemns that but do you think the Pakistani army is innocent committing an ongoing genocide in Balochistan for the last 70 years it's uh, by no means innocent so the loss of Pakistani army lives i don't think qualify as innocent people Balochistan's insurgency is rooted in long standing demands for autonomy and deep resentment toward Islamabad's exploitative policies. Though rich in natural resources like gas, coal and minerals, the province's population remains among the poorest in Pakistan. Basic facilities like education and healthcare are lacking with over 70% of the population living in poverty. The Baloch see little benefit from the province's wealth and activists accuse the government of keeping Balochistan under developed to retain control. Pakistan occupied Balochistan primarily to loot, plunder and exploit its resources. It was never interested in the Baloch people or joining of two countries as they put it. Uh, they it's just the land to provide resources for the Pakistanis. in general the pakistani generals in particular from history till present balochistan is a land to loot plunder and uh, the fat cats sitting in pindi they are reaping the rewards so the baloch have stood up all along against this injustice and we've been appealing to the world to stand with us uh, but unfortunately our appeal has always fallen on deaf ears now the baloch have changed their tactic or maybe the new generation have had enough so their the tactics are a bit more 
uh, harsher than previously. Decades of unfulfilled promises and suppression have left Baloch groups with little faith in Islamabad's intentions. Chinese investment through the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has added to these grievances, particularly in Gwadar, where the expansion has displaced many locals. While jobs and infrastructure improvements were promised, Baloch residents report being shut out of these economic benefits as the land is handed over to foreign investors. The resulting debt to China has fueled fears of further marginalization for the Baloch people. The insurgency in Balochistan has reached a critical point driven by Islamabad's refusal to acknowledge Baloch demands for autonomy. For the Baloch, this is a fight for control over their land and future against a government more focused on resource extraction rather than the development of its people. With resentment mounting, the future of Pakistan's control over Balochistan hangs in the balance. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.